Okay. Uh, I thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to present uh, on the topic. So I would. Uh, let me okay. So the brief outline is that I would start talking uh, on surface plasma at a source, and uh, which would touch upon electron acceleration from plasma mirrors and uh, high harmonic generation from uh, plasma, uh, relativistically different plasma surfaces. And I'd also give you novel application examples, uh, which were thought impossible a few years ago. And uh, I'd also mention uh, the institute where I work now and uh, the potential of that institute along these directions. So let me start with this uh, image. This is the artist's impression of reality. And uh, as it correctly mentioned, it came in nature basically. Uh, it correctly shows that the solar system is 99.85% plasma. The interplanetary medium is near 100% plasma. Intergalactic medium is also near 100% plasma. That means that the universe which is visible is 99.999% in plasma form. And we are lucky enough to live in the rest 0.001% uh, of what we can see. And uh, we are even more luckier uh, to enjoy uh, scientific research uh, from wherever we are doing. And of course, you can reach uh, this kind of plasma state in multiple ways. Uh, the way that I would speak uh, is basically uh, focusing intense lasers uh, on uh, targets, which can be solid or gas. So as you go higher up uh, along the intensity axis, which is the vertical one, then at certain point, you ionize any medium that the light interacts with. And then as you go even higher up in intensity, which is around 10 to 18 or 20 watts per centimeter square, then the relativistic effects uh, starts to uh, uh, participate. And of course, uh, with new laser facilities coming around the world, uh, one can uh, go uh, up uh, for new physics and uh, particular acceleration point of view or harmonic generation point of view. So this is the example. Uh, this is uh, from IBS uh, in Corel. This is uh, the two most powerful ultra short. When I say ultra short, it is in the few femtoseconds, like tens or thirties of femtoseconds. Uh, ultra short lasers, which are working right now. And uh, this is another one, which is Bella in Lawrence Berkeley uh, National Laboratory. And of course, uh, with ELI facilities uh, coming online uh, quite soon, uh, this would again go uh, quite high. So this is uh, basically uh, the map of Europe. The orange part is uh, Hungary, and the Eli Alps or Eli Atosegen Light Pulse Facility is uh, situated on the southern part of Hungary in a city called uh, Szeged. And uh, this is a top view picture. So in the center where Eli Atosegen is uh, written, this is the facility, and uh, there is a planned sign uh, science park surrounding it, and. The orange part in the center in this image is basically uh, the ELI uh, facility, and then there is a plan to organize a science park with industries and everything around uh, this uh, facility. And if you look at the facility building, uh, it looks uh, in this uh, way. And A, building A is basically where all the experiments and lasers would be situated. The other ones are basically uh, office buildings and uh, workshops and things like that. And this is, uh, uh, so the building part is already ready. We are going to ship there uh, in a few weeks, one or two weeks. And uh, this is the image, this is the most recent image that I could have uh, gathered uh, in August uh, 2016. So the structure of the experiments is that we have uh, a sequence of a uh, series of lasers, which are we call primary sources. And then we should drive interaction with different sorts of targets and generate different secondary, what we call secondary sources, which are particles accelerated or uh, X-ray pulses generated. And then there would be experiments in uh, this section, the green part, and as well as it would be taken for further experimentation and, and uh, user end stations. So the lasers basically uh, are, uh, there are many uh, lasers in uh, this uh, facility in particular. There would be 100 kilohertz, uh, one millijoule laser, which we call HL laser. And the last two lasers, which are written like silos laser, which is 
uh, few cycle, 100 millijoule, one kilohertz uh, laser, and the 34 joule, 17 femtosecond, 10 hertz laser, which is a petawatt laser. So these two lasers would be used to drive uh, laser solid interaction. And uh, these are unique laser because the Silos laser is CEP controlled and uh, the petawatt laser is basically when it, uh, once it start operating, it would become the shortest uh, pulse duration petawatt laser working anywhere in the world. And this basically shows uh, the 3D uh, picture of the building A. So you can see uh, the, the lasers would be situated uh, somewhere here, what we call LCR. And then there are different, different beam lines, some driving gas harmonics, some driving uh, solid uh, laser solid interaction. So there are different radiation protected uh, regions with different degrees of radiation protection. So my group is basically responsible for the, what we call silos, the kilohertz laser driven uh, laser solid interaction uh, with the direction of generating attosecond pulses and charges. And the other one is petawatt driven SSG uh, beam line, surface high harmonic beam line. So when we talk about ultra short pulses, then basically it has uh, some extra properties as well. So as uh, were shown in uh, this uh, publications uh, that I present here, and especially in the last one, you can see this is the 3D space time reconstruction, a really working ultra short pulse. And the pulse duration was around uh, 30 frames per second in this case. And what is interesting is that uh, this kind of pulses, it not only has uh, simple uh, properties like polarization, uh, pulse duration energy, it also has spatiotemporal characteristics. So, so this kind of features actually enriches uh, the possibilities that can be implemented uh, during experimentation in such facilities. So anyway, so when you take this kind of ultra short pulse with uh, very high intensity and you focus this pulse on target, by target I call uh, gas or solid targets, then basically if it is a solid target, then uh, if it is uh, sufficiently polished, if the pulse quality is high in terms of temporal contrast and spatial contrast, then it can act as a reflector where the plasma surface is relativistically driven, it's called plasma mirror, or it can be a under dense plasma. And I'm sure that you already have uh, quite a few uh, speakers who spoke about acceleration from this under dense uh, plasma. So just to uh, mention, this is a, a very famous slide. I borrowed it from uh, Victor Malka. And uh, it is already demonstrated uh, that uh, there is strange similarity between uh, a superconducting cavity, uh, which accelerates in a linear accelerator, and the wake field structure, uh, which exists over a micron scale, when you focus very intense laser on a uh, under dense plasma. And because of this, uh, it can act as an accelerator and uh, it started uh, materializing uh, starting from the experiments of 2004 and the recent record as far as I know, uh, until 2014, it was four GV electron uh, accelerated uh, presented in this paper. And of course, this uh, it cannot compare with a linear accelerator in many other parameters, but at least it can provide an alternative way with complementary uh, features of the accelerated charge bunches. So just let me uh, give very uh, different type of uh, applications uh, with this. So this is the typical laser plasma accelerator in under dense case. So the laser is uh, focused and then basically it is propagating through a plasma. It is a particle and cell simulation. And you can see that there is a void. What you see in red color is basically uh, electronic density when the laser pulse is propagating through the plasma. And then you can see that uh, in the back of the uh, hollow region, there is uh, charge bunches, which are electrons, which are collected and accelerated. What you see propagating is basically the light field, which is uh, propagating through the under dense plasma. And so this is the basic scheme under optimal conditions. It can give different kind of uh, wake field structures and acceleration schemes, but this is the basic schemes. And what you have at the end of the day is that you have an electron uh, charge bunch, which is accelerated by the laser. And also at the same time, the charge bunch oscillates and it gives beta tron radiation, which uh, you can see as uh, X-ray. Uh, so just to give two very uh, different examples, to start with, the first example I give, 
for use of this kind of uh, accelerator is that uh, here, for example, in this case, uh, which uh, the experiment done uh, by uh, Jason Cole uh, during his PhD. So the laser was focused, and Rajiv might be aware of this thing because it was uh, done with Astragemini. So the laser was focused to the parabolic mirror, and they generate the electrons and uh, the beta tron radiation. The electrons are diverted using a magnetic field, and then the, the X-ray radiation is collected and then it passes through a target, which is a bone sample. And when you rotate this target, one can collect information here and through theoretical uh, analysis and uh, uh, solving uh, uh, the algorithm, one can reconstruct the 3D uh, distribution of the target, basically. So in this case, what they used is something called uh, trabecular bones and when the tomographic reconstruction was made, uh, one can see a non-invasive technique using laser accelerated uh, electrons which generate the hard X-ray to see 3D resolved uh, distribution of this kind of bones. So this was a demonstration experiment, very nice one. Then it not only contains uh, the hard X-ray when the electron has a very high uh, kinetic energy, so it basically drives an electro, uh, electronic current also through the plasma. And you know that plasma is uh, something which wants to shield itself against uh, charge fluctuation. So when the current flows in the forward direction, in this case from the right of the picture to the left side, and then the plasma tries to respond by giving a back current outside where this electron is propagating. So then this can be visualized that the electron current gives a magnetic field, plasma tries to shield by generating some return current, and then one can see across the plasma some magnetic field dynamics where you can have alternative shells of uh, azimuthal magnetic field, a positive and negative signs. So just to mo motivate this further, here I made a schematic. You can see a sun on the, the sun on the left side and the earth uh, on the right side. And we know that earth's magnetic field reaches uh, 36,000 miles into space and protects us uh, from uh, solar wind, uh, which is nothing but charged particle flow from sun from time to time. And when the solar wind uh, starts, it basically, it has its own uh, uh, magnetic field lines. And then it starts interacting with earth's uh, magnetic uh, field lines as well. and uh, this involves some concept which is called magnetic reconnection. It is nothing but creation and annihilation, a rearrangement of magnetic li uh, lines of force or magnetic fields in plasma, where the oppositely directed magnetic lines of force, when they come in very close contact within plasma, they can redistribute energy in a very strange ways. And this is a very interesting astrophysical uh, topic. And uh, I show here a movie from NASA so what you would see here is basically the sun. It is an animation basically, because you cannot record this kind of things in reality. So what you see is sun, and then you can see the solar flare. And then gradually you see earth with its magnetosphere, magnetic uh, field lines, and the charged particle flow from sun interacts with it. And you see that the, it compresses the magnetic lines of uh, force here on this side where I put the cursor. And then basically the oppositely directed lines of force comes close together and there is reconnection and huge redistribution of energy from the field to the particles. So this is to impress the point that it is a very interesting uh, topic. And there are very uh, quite a many uh, few questions which demands uh, clear answers. So for example, why B field generate in astrophysical scenario in the first place? What makes this kind of fields grow? how these fields intermingle, reconnect, redistribute energy. Is it possible to watch it in the lab? So there have been many uh, publications with laser plasma sources. So I would just present one uh, which we did and is just the application two. So one was in the biomedical application and the other one I'm presenting uh, here. So we just used a uh, gas jet target which was uh, developed by us, which is patented also. So it can reach very high density, supercritical density also, and it has a uh, density profile which can be tailored. So in this case, what we used, a uh, very standard technique. So you focus the laser on the gas jet, 
Then you generate the charge bunches that I showed in the first simulation. You accelerate electrons and it generates a azimuthal magnetic field uh, around the propagation direction. And then you launch a probe beam, which basically connect, uh, collects standard interferometric image of this interaction region. And at the same time, simultaneously, it also collects uh, polarimetric images of the interaction region. And what you can do, I would not go into the details of this, but what you can do is that you can capture the B field uh, movie micron scale uh, resolved and femtosecond time resolved. So that's what I'm going to show you. So it's basically uh, the data, raw data. So what you see here is in microns. So as the light is uh, the yellow one, and the first uh, first picture uh, vertically above, it represents uh, light as it propagates and the density uh, in the plasma, electronic density. The picture below, it shows uh, the magnetic field uh, reconstruction basically. And the colors, red or blue, they indicate whether the field lines are azimuthally into the target or outside the target. So as the light propagates, you can watch light propagate inside the medium real time with micro, uh, micron scale resolution and femtosecond time resolution. So you can see that it goes from lower density plasma to high density plasma and to the low density and the light uh, emerges from the other side. And here you see a very complicated evolution of the magnetic field structure. And it becomes even more meaningful when you take a line out, that means you collect the magnetic field as a function of time at a particular location in the gas plasma or the gas accelerator, then basically, if you collect the line and then look at the time evolution, the interesting thing one uh, can watch is that here, for example, the first uh, picture uh, uh, below, if you can see my cursor, it is on the low density part. And the B field lines are oriented in a particular way, uh, which is uh, understandable from the uh, current direction to begin with and the plasma tries to shield it by making uh, other shells of magnetic field. But as the laser propagates to the high density region, this magnetic field, it tries to reverse or invert its detection. And then as the laser propagates to high density backwards, there is a turbulent uh, region and then the complete reversal has taken place. So what you see is uh, blue and red here, it becomes red and blue here. So. This kind of system, it gives uh, some uh, scope also where we didn't do this uh, from the magnetic reconnection point of view, but it provides some opportunity to proceed along that lines as well. And this was reproduced in 3D particle and cell simulations using OSIRIS code. Uh, and uh, we can see this kind of cell structures in the current density and as well as the reversal of the magnetic field uh, in this plasma. And this simulation was done for the real experimental system. So this shows two diverse uh, examples, uh, what can be done. There can be multiple things which can be done. But uh, now I move to the topic that I uh, would talk mainly, which is uh, in the overdense plasma. So when you focus light on overdense plasma, and if the light is sufficiently uh, temporally clean, and also you focus it very tight, then basically you can generate a very thin, very sharp gradient plasma layer on the uh, dielectric mirror. And this layer is so sharp that the scale length is much, much less than the lambda. And when you do that, then basically you generate electrons, protons, ions, and also you generate XUV uh, high harmonics. So let us see, uh, what, okay, before I go into uh, more details, uh, you can also, tailor or control this uh, density gradient by just uh, letting a pre-pulse interact with the initially solid target and then you delay your main pulse which interacts with a predefined density gradient and this can be implemented in a, by a very simple uh, experimental scheme where before the focusing optics you have a big mirror and a small mirror uh, in front of it and so basically the small mirror reflects a portion of the same light and the big mirror reflects the rest and then you focus both. So this is the setup uh, which does that. And when you focus both, the big beam is Fourier transformed and focused over a small region and the small beam 
is also Fourier transformed and focused over a large region. And in this way, you can create a pre-pulse, main pulse system, and you can have, of course, control delay between the two meters. And uh, in this way, you can have a jitter-free system. So that is what we use for all the experiments. And uh, okay, so when you do, and of course, you can characterize this using some interferometric technique. Uh, we used Fourier uh, domain interferometry to encode in the probe light the plasma expansion. So you encode in the probe light the plasma expansion uh, speed. And uh, then you can make a study with uh, fluence, how the speed changes in order to derive the scale length of the plasma. So this is a simulation, basically, a plasma mirror which I just showed, driven at high intensity, which is uh, greater than 10 to 19 at 800 nanometer, let's say. And this is in lab laboratory reference frame. So what you see is that basically in the gray scale is the plasma electron density. It is a solid density target. It's a particle and cell simulation, two, two dimensional. And the laser is incident at 45 degree, uh, p-polarized light. So you can see that the laser is incident now. And in each cycle of the laser, what you would see as color scale is basically the attosecond pulses that are emitted. Because the, <coughs> sorry, the plasma mirror imprints a Doppler shift and you have attosecond pulses. Things become more clear if you go to boosted frame. So this shows uh, uh, the simulation, simulation, but in a boosted frame so that public incidence can be transformed into a normal incidence. And you can see that along the polarization direction of light, there is periodic oscillation of this electronic uh, surface, which is the plasma mirror surface. And here the main laser is filtered out. So what you see is basically attosecond pulse emission at each cycle, one attosecond pulse emission. So this is something which is, and you can, you can also see, so if we wait sufficiently, then uh, the attosecond pulses are emitted. And along with that, you can see some electrons are going out, some are coming back, and some are oscillating. So this constitutes three electron populations, basically. So let us talk about the electrons that are moving out. That I call one. So this is a particle and cell simulation, and you impinge a laser with laser intensity around few times 10 to 19 watt per centimeter square, and the pulse duration like 30 femtosecond. And when we do the simulation, then we see that in the reflected laser light, these black uh, spikes you see, they are injected electrons. And then uh, when we uh, trace, do particle tracing of the electrons, so this only shows uh, very close to the plasma mirror target. And when you do particle tracing you, uh, to see the, what happens further, these electrons in the charge uh, in the electric field of the laser, then we see that once expelled from the surface, the electrons co-propagate with the reflected laser fields over a distance of the order of Rayleigh length. So the laser and the electron, they interact over, the, over an order of Rayleigh uh, length of the focusing. And of course, electrons are accelerated in this kind of uh, situation. And experimentally, we tuned the plasma density gradient and we also optimized different parameters. And what we uh, saw is that uh, so this uh, this uh, special profile this is the special profile of the electron beam that emerges in the reflected light direction. So the center where I put the cursor, where you see a hollow structure, is basically the direction of the reflected laser light, and then we see this kind of structure of electron uh, accelerated from the plasma mirror surface. And if you take uh, when you put spectrometer uh, to resolve uh, the energy of the electrons from the, this region, central region, or that region, we see that we have uh, quasi-monoenergetic features, which are like 10 MeV electrons accelerated under these conditions from the plasma mirror. And the charge content of the beam is quite high, which is 12 nanocoulomb. Usually in laser accelerators, it is in the order of picocoulombs. And in order to understand that, we did further simulation. So this red color, it shows the light field reflected from the plasma mirror. And the blue color, it shows the temporal density profile of ejected energetic electrons. And when we look in the phase space, then we see that electrons has two momenta. 
one along the direction of the propagation, which is the red one, and another along the reflected field polarization direction. And when we look in light frame, so this is the laser light where we see alternating blue and red. This is the laser light. And this shows uh, the situation for two electrons in light frame. So as the laser light passes through, because the electron speed is always less than the light speed, then basically some of the electrons, they, they would see very less number of laser cycles and some other electrons would see many cycles. And when we calculated the Lorentz factor, which gives basically the electron energy, then we saw that those electrons we call by NOC, the number of optical cycles explored by the electrons before escaping the laser beam. So what we saw is that for those electrons for which NOC was one or less than one, then they gain sufficient energy if they are injected in the laser pulse by the laser pulse itself. Whereas those electrons which crosses uh, too many optical cycles, they are ponderomotively scattered. And then finally, they don't gain that much energy. And also the other interesting thing we saw, uh, this is the 3D calculation basically modeling. Uh, so we take the electrons injected from the particles in cell simulation and then, then do particle tracing code uh, with those electrons in the laser field. What we see is that the angular profile of the beam for the ponderomotively scattered electrons are a hollow profile, whereas the electrons that gain sufficient energy, which we called is VLA or vacuum laser acceleration, they are uh, peaked. And then when you continue uh, this kind of calculation, varying the number of cycles each electron crosses, then you can basically, and when you superpose all these things, then you can generate a structure which is strikingly similar to the experimental uh, configuration. So basically the donut step is due to ponderomotive uh, scattering and the central lobe is because of uh, VLA. And this is the simulation basically. So initially it is in the lab frame. So laser is coming, interacting, they're injecting electrons and you see that the electrons are propagating. And now we change our coordinate system uh, let me show it again, to the uh, moving frame with the laser. And you can see that there are some electrons which are ejected and the others are accelerated. So this, uh, this appeared actually, if you are interested in more detail, then you can uh, read this paper. So this kind of explains what we saw experimentally. And for the first time, let us identify uh, something. This is called vacuum laser acceleration of realistic electrons using the plasma mirror uh, injectors. And now let us uh, talk about the electrons that are coming back. Now the electrons that are coming back, so this is the plasma surface, the electrons uh, get excited, which are the Brunel electrons or so-called vacuum metal electrons. Then they come back and then they cross inside the plasma density gradient and then they excite the plasma, those electrons. And the excited plasma then can do radiation, which is called coherent wake emission. So I would not discuss much about this. It is just to mention for the sake of completeness. So what happens is that the electrons are periodically plucked out by the electric field, and then they are again dumped back to the plasma mirror surface. And each time they're dumped back, because of the charge density oscillation it creates, it emits one attosecond pulses. And so in time domain, you have spikes. And when you do Fourier transform in frequency domain, you have uh, high order harmonics from the, uh, in this kind of uh, regime. But this is very efficient at lower intensities. What I would talk more about is electrons oscillating relativistically. So it's again the same, uh, I, uh, same uh, simulation I showed. So you see in a boosted frame, the electron starts, uh, the plasma mirror surface starts oscillating uh, relativistically in the light field. And then it emits, uh, it imprints Doppler spike in the laser field. And if you filter out the fundamental of the laser, then this is basically in temporal domain, there's a sequence of attosecond pulses and in frequency domain, these are harmonics. So this is a very, uh, below you see a very uh, crude schematic of what is happening there. So it's the incident laser, let's say sinusoid or for uh, explicitness, then it imprints Doppler spikes. And if you filter out the fundamental, then you are left with attosecond pulses in time domain and high harmonics in the frequency domain. 
So now, of course, you can play with the plasma mirror because the, uh, the plasma density gradient or the plasma expansion velocity, it varies with the laser fluence. If you imprint this kind of uh, focal spot structure on the plasma mirror target, then of course uh, you can generate a modulated plasma surface with modulated expansion. So this is the uh, hydrodynamic simulation which I did. And it shows that if you imprint this kind of intensity distribution on the plasma mirror target, then basically, and wait for a predefined time, then basically the plasma can grow and generate a grating structure. So this is something which is called optically uh, uh, imprintable gratings. Uh, so this appeared in this uh, publication basically. And then I would show you can do many interesting stuff with this kind of grating. So uh, just briefly to summarize that you just use uh, two meters instead of one, as I showed before. And then you can control the distance between the mirrors and you can control the relative delay between the mirrors. And of course, you can totally optically control the grating that you generate. You can control the periodicity at will, and you can control the depth of the grating at will. And you can, of course, reach different configurations by <coughs> changing the central hole, which controls the main pulse size. <coughs> Sorry. So you can make the main pulse interact with a grating of uh, um, large number of grating uh, periods or a less number of grating periods. You can be in different, different interesting regimes. And uh, let me give uh, an example. So this is uh, on the vertical axis, it is the angle. On the horizontal axis, it is the harmonic order. So this is in low intensity CWE regime. And you see the pre-pulse is a big focal spot and the main pulse, which is generating the harmonics here uh, is a small uh, focal spot. So this is a just normal plasma mirror. And when you put the gratings, you see the harmonics, they're generated and diffracted by this grating. So this was very uh, convincing evidence that even at this intensity, the gratings that you are generating, they are really intact. And at very high intensity regime, so which is 10 to 19, which is a ROM regime, relative hystic oscillating mirror regime. So we have harmonics. Uh, this is the same harmonic and this is the divergence. Now, from a flat plasma mirror, we have this kind of harmonics. And when we launch the gratings, which are also optically controlled, then we have diffraction in the harmonic orders visible. So this uh, made sure that uh, in all the operating uh, intensities, this grating was uh, really working very nicely. And the beautiful thing about this grating is that we were able to control it uh, during the experiment itself, uh, the periodicity and everything. And let me give uh, an example of uh, using this uh, kind of structure to make something extremely more meaningful. So I will present something which uh, I prefer calling some advanced metrology because uh, it didn't exist in this field. So this is a simulation basically, uh, again. So on the left, you see electronic density is the same simulation, but uh, on a different kind of parameters. And on the right, you see the ion density. So you can see that the light has interacted with the electrons and then there is, you see, light starts interacting, electrons start responding to high frequency light. And then basically there is a dent because the light pressure is uh, pushing it. And this somehow is pushing the ion uh, surface also. And what is to be noted here is that the electron spikes, that means we saw in previous, the harmonics are generated from here, in the spikes, I mean, that are second pulses. So those spikes, that means the jets, they follow the denting surface. So this correlation is very important. And then, <coughs> this is another example at a very high intensity. So if you focus very tightly, this is a 2D uh, simulation, uh, particle and cell. Then if you focus the laser very tightly, then you see these are harmonics, fundamental is filtered out. You see, the harmonics are focused. That means the laser while interacting, they are denting or curving the plasma mirror surface and the curved surface is generating harmonics which are getting focused. So it is just to impress the point uh, okay, this work is very nicely presented, actually. I consider this work a uh, very good work. And this uh, presents a model as well as the simulation results of these things, uh, along with experimental evidences of this denting. But the point, uh, the take home message is that light, uh, even within its pulse duration, can create uh, denting in the plasma surface, which is like uh, effect of light on the surface. And uh, this, uh, uh, getting an idea of this or measuring this accurately, is, is a very interesting thing from a different physics point of view and application point of view, application for the harmonics, for example. And uh, 
So it's bending of the mirror by light, and then you have a harmonic source. So the next experiment uh, show is that it basically just uh, shows the same thing, but in enhanced mode. So if you have here, you have the denting of the surface, and then the generated harmonics, because they also capture the special phase of this uh, shape, they get focused. So now I would show you uh, something, but before that, just uh, to give a strong message. So I just took two images. This is basically uh, the famous guy, Rick Trevino, uh, who basically invented or uh, made a uh, frog, which are used uh, frequently. And uh, she is our wife, Linda. So I took the two images, which are nothing but basically matrix, uh, matrices, and then you do Fourier transform of Rick's image, and you do Fourier transform of Linda's image, and you get another matrix, which is a multiplication of Rick's spectral intensity and Rick's spectral phase, uh, e to the power i Rick's spectral phase, and same for Linda. Now what I do is that I exchange the spectral phases in the Fourier transforms, so put Linda's phase uh, in Rick's amplitude and uh, Rick's phase in Linda's amplitude, and then I do that, and then basically what I do, I back Fourier transform. What, what I see is that even if the amplitude is changed, the phase is more important. That means if you preserve Linda's phase and multiply it with Rick's amplitude, and you back Fourier transform, you still get back Linda's, uh, you still recognize uh, Linda. So from this very simple textbook example, uh, there is a very strong take home message. And the message is that the Fourier phase is more important for determining the direct space intensity. That means any detector, uh, uh, detector we are using, basically most of them, they measure intensity. We don't measure phase directly. So if we want to measure phase of some interaction using detectors which measures intensity, it is well advised that the measurement plane and the detector plane be in the Fourier transform uh, conjugate uh, planes of each other. Uh, this is the take home message. It's a very uh, simple example, but very insightful uh, uh, message basically. So this principle we use, and this is also used very powerfully in a te technique which is called uh, tichography. What is done basically, there is a light field so when you say light field, it has its amplitude profile, that means the intensity profile and a phase profile. And of course, a special intensity, special phase and uh, all this, what we call probe. And then there is an object which we want to probe. So in this case, I showed you what we want to probe is basically this light dented plasma mirror surface. And then you have a detector plane, which is the diffraction where you capture the diffraction pattern. And what is done in this technique is that the object is scanned and then the corresponding diffraction patterns are collected. And then from those diffraction patterns, an algorithm is used. So basically this plane, the object plane and the detector plane is connected by Fourier transform. Then in the real space, the object is uh, translated. In the reciprocal space, data is collected and then using some back algorithm, you give the collected data as input and then go to the real space, put some real space constraint and again come to the uh, object, I mean, uh, detector plane. And then you continue this uh, algorithm until you reach convergence. And this way, it has been shown uh, in many, many papers, but I mentioned this too, basically uh, by Thibault in science. So it has been shown that one can measure the complete information about the object as well as the complete information about the field. It's a very powerful technique. So in this particular example, for example, what he did is he took a uh, very uh, nanometric uh, uh, pattern and he was able to extract, you can see on the left side, A and B, their amplitude profile and phase profile of the object. And on the right side, the uh, field profile and the face profile also was there, I didn't put it, of the probing beam. So this is the technique that we want to use and how we want to use it in laser plasma, uh, relativistic laser plasma interaction, which is very complicated in itself. So what we do is that we generate an object, as I told you, the transient gratings uh, by using two probe pulses, and then we launch the main pulse and generate harmonics from this grating surface. 
and then basically we collect the harmonics and let it pass through the uh, flat field spectrometer into an MCP and we look at the harmonic diffraction pattern. So this is the Fourier plane, this is the object plane and this though in the image uh, we have shown the grating as enhanced but in reality it is very very tiny so it acts as a phase modulation to the uh, interacting uh, beam. It's a, the expansion is very, very small. And we are in this kind of configuration. And okay, we can achieve this kind of configuration by just putting two mirrors which are very close together to generate the grating pattern. I don't go into more detail. <clears throat> and now what we have is that this is the harmonic source and this is the grating pattern generated. And in the detector plane, what we measure is the Fourier transform of uh, this source, and this is the grating. So this is basically the total object. In the Fourier plane, you measure just the mod square of uh, the Fourier transform of this. Now, what happens is that you scan the grating across uh, the focal spot, which is the source, and then basically you can see in the diffraction plane, as the grating is scanned, the divergence and the directionality of the harmonics is changing. So what we do finally is that this is the experimental scheme. So you generate uh, the interaction here, collect the data here, and we also image the focal plane at the same time through the transmitted uh, light into another corresponding plane. So that means as we are doing the interaction at very high intensity, at the same time we are also collecting uh, the overlap of the grating and the main pulse. And when you do that, of course, you can change the relative position. And we collect sufficient data so that we scan across the whole uh, period. And then using the algorithm, what you can reconstruct, this is the experimental trace and this is the reconstructed trace. And what you show on the right side top is the harmonic source uh, amplitude and the dashed curve is basically the phase. And you, at the same time, you also reconstruct the grating, uh, plasma grating structure. And so this appeared in uh, this uh, paper, basically. And of course, so you measure, uh, we measure the harmonic source and the harmonic uh, phase and amplitude, as I told you, and the grating as well. And of course, this phase, the harmonic is basically coming from the light imprim imprinted dent on the plasma mirror surface. So one can exactly determine how much uh, radiation uh, pressure due to light is changing the plasma mirror surface during the pulse duration in the uh, interaction region from doing uh, some far field measurement. So this is a very powerful technique and uh, and of course, you can do the same analysis uh, for each harmonic and extract the same information for each harmonic. And uh, finally, one can reconstruct the spatial amplitude profile and the spatial phase profile of each harmonic in the interaction. So <clears throat> only once can uh, one can uh, extract all the information. So basically, uh, uh, before uh, thanking my collaborators, uh, I'll just summarize. So I presented that uh, from the plasma mirror and relativistic interaction, you can have electrons either going out or coming back and electrons also oscillating with very high uh, light intensity. And for each portion of these electrons, there is tremendous scope uh, and this electron dynamics, it leads to accelerators. It also leads to higher order harmonics and attosecond pulses. And uh, I would thank uh, my colleagues at uh, CES Acle, which is this Atomic Energy Commission in France. Uh, and then at LOA, which is called Polytechnic, uh, Rodrigo Lopez Marta, Victor Malka, Jerome Faure, and at uh, Queen's University Belfast, to, with whom I have collaborations. And also, uh, I, I thank my uh, group members, Jisudipto, uh, Navid, and uh, Mushtawa. And uh, also, I'd like to uh, bring your attention if somebody will be interested that there are some positions or job openings uh, for research fellow and uh, early stage researchers in the group as well. Thank you.
Halo? Ya? Yeah. Sorry, come again please. What was the scale length? Yes. Uh -huh. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. The scale length, yes, the scale length, I don't think that I would be able to exactly tell you, but it was uh, lambda over, uh, it was like, uh, of course it is sub lambda, it was like lambda over 10 or something like that, if I remember correctly. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, 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 of, of course, of course. So, okay, let me go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the electrons are not created from vacuum. So for sure, they're coming from the plasma mirror itself. And uh, second, let me go back to the figure so that I can uh, show it to you. Uh, Here. Uh, here. Okay. So, okay. So here, actually, if you see this simulation, so there are two things here. First is that the initial condition. So, okay, I, uh, we can only do PIC simulation in order to retrieve information because uh, there is no measurement inside the plasma mirror that anybody is doing. So what we did uh, using state of the art is that uh, we saw that this is the light field, the red one is the light field. And this is the initial conditions of electrons, even before they are ejected, that, uh, before they're accelerated by the VLA scheme. So this is during, as I showed in other uh, simulation also, that as the mirror electrons oscillate, there are electrons which are coming out of that. and. Uh, and some electrons are coming back, some electrons are oscillating. Now, a population of those electrons, some of them, which are favorably uh, located with respect to the laser uh, pulse duration, they are injected favorably in the light direction. So in the simulation uh, in the blue, you would see the temporal density profile of the ejected uh, energetic electrons. And Mm -hmm. uh, no, 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 not all, not, no. There are electrons which are pulled out, some are pulled back, some are not pulled back uh, also. And now those electrons, if, if this is basically the phase space representation, the one below, the blue and the red. So the blue basically, it gives the corresponding momenta. So you see these blue peaks here on the other curve, which are temporal density profile. Now the blue here represents everything here in this phase space correspond to this uh, electron bunches. Now the corresponding momentum distribution of these electrons along the specular direction. So the red one is basically along the specular direction, those population of electrons, which are along the specular direction and the blue one is basically along the polarization direction of the reflected laser. So there are two populations. One is along the polarization direction, another is along the specular direction. And now those electrons, if we go to the next slide, so those electrons are the injected electrons. And among those electrons, because some are along the polarization direction as well, so there are there is a population of electrons which statistically it can cross multiple cycles or it can cross few cycles so this this is a model uh, this one is a model but the before one is the injection process itself and when when we say vla sorry hmm.
from the plasma mirror. No, if you calculate nanocoulomb, you would see, I mean, you don't need huge amount of uh, plasma to make nanocoulomb charge. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yes, 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 yes. 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 Sorry, I didn't understand what you were telling. Can you repeat yourself? Yes. Uh huh. Yes, yes. The laser cycle number electron crosses. Yes. Yes. No, why? No, no, why, why you say so? There is no concept of ponderomotive uh, scattering for one cycle laser. The whole, whole concept of ponderomotive... Yes? No, 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 this one is, okay. This one, what I show here on the left, is not, is not when I say ponderomotive, it is nothing or no approximation is assumed in this calculation. It is basically relativistic low range force acting on electrons which are traversing in this way and in that way. And when, if you, what happens in case of ponderomotive scattered electron, what we call ponderomotively scattered electron is that because you traverse so many uh, cycles, so your energy is basically averaged out and you don't gain because you have to be in phase in any accelerator anywhere in the world, plasma accelerator, linear accelerator or wherever, galactic accelerator. In order to be accelerated, the charge has to be in phase, some sort of in phase with the field from which it gains energy. Now the ponderomotive electron doesn't have this privilege and that is why it is not gaining energy from the light field which is done by the VL electrons. So, sorry, sorry, uh, can you please uh, repeat again because I, I am hearing lots of noise and uh, I don't know, there is a lot of noise. Let me, thank you.